Type 2 diabetes and obesity are two very closely linked conditions. Um, the question arises what links them? One of the hypotheses is they might be linked by common genetic predisposition. It's been long known that both obesity, which we characterize as excess body fat, and is usually measured by having a high body mass index, the ratio of weight divided by height squared, being excess of 30, and also type 2 diabetes, which is a disorder of chronic hyperglycemia. It's well known that both of those conditions run in families, and from twin studies, we know that the heritability of both conditions is around 50%. The big question is, what is the molecular basis for that? Now, early progress in trying to unravel that molecular basis relied on extreme phenotypes, monogenic conditions that occur, which appear to have a more autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. In the case of diabetes, uh, the initial focus was on forms of diabetes that looked like type 2 diabetes, but which came on early on in adulthood and tended to have an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance and run in families. And this gave rise to the notion of uh, MODI or maturity onset diabetes of, of the young. And modern uh, genetics has allowed that condition to be unraveled into several different subtypes. And the importance of that is not only that it enables people to have a diagnosis, also that it enables uh, a clear uh, pathway of pathogenesis towards the condition to be unraveled. But perhaps most importantly of all, it allows for personalization of treatment. And in some forms of MODI, patients have benefited from being switched to particular types of glucose lowering treatment. Now in the case of obesity, the identification of monogenic forms of obesity was a bit slower. And indeed, colleagues here at the Institute of Metabolic Science in Cambridge have really led the way in finding families in, in, in which there are uh, infants, particularly, who have very early onset, very uh, acute forms of, of obesity. And the first uh, gene that was identified was the, the leptin gene. Leptin is a key hormone involved in satiation or the suppression of, of hunger. And the, the children found to have uh, mutations in the leptin gene had uncontrollable appetite and very uh, severe early onset obesity. And this is important, like MODI, not, not just because it allows one to give rise to diagnosis, but in case of those children, it gave rise to a therapy because leptin replacement therapy actually overcame the problems of overeating and obesity. And in, in the case of those uh, infants, they actually uh, uh, became much more normal in terms of their body composition. So the key question is whether one can take those rare monogenic insights into human uh, metabolism and disease and transfer them to the, the, the majority of the population in whom such uh, rare forms of diabetes and obesity do not occur. Now that is a much bigger scientific challenge and it only became tractable as a scientific problem with the development of technology. Uh, our ability to characterize uh, the range of variation in the whole genome has largely been driven by a combination of uh, developments in genotyping and global collaboration in consortia around the world with the accumulation of very large population studies of people with obesity and diabetes. And it's that combination of technology coupled together with uh, uh, global collaboration that's really given rise to, um, to, to insights into the disease. In the case of diabetes, there are now 100 or so uh, diabetes genes that have been identified. They started with a gene called TCF7L2, which impacts on insulin uh, secretion. Uh, that gene was actually identified by a different approach of positional cloning and not by this uh, form of mass genotyping, which we call genome-wide association study. But it's been followed by a whole range of other genes that have been identified. Progress in obesity was somewhat different and actually 
the first gene that was identified was uh, FTO, which was identified in the UK by um, a whole genome, uh, genome-wide association study, and is followed by other obesity genes, the second of which was the melanocortin-4 receptor, which was identified to be associated with obesity by colleagues here in Cambridge. As in diabetes, there are now 100 or so genes that have been associated with obesity. In both conditions, obesity and diabetes, uh, the question is, so what? How has this development in understanding of the genetics helped us? And I think it's helped us in a number of ways. It's fueled uh, other research that's led from those genes to start thinking about what are the pathways that link from that genetic association to the pathogenesis and to the disease. In the case of FTO and obesity, that's been a somewhat prolonged and difficult uh, scientific journey, and we haven't yet unraveled what it is that uh, gives rise to the underlying biology behind the association between FTO and obesity. In the case of diabetes and hyperglycemia, we've also identified novel biology from studying genetic association studies. For example, the melatonin receptor gene is associated with fasting hyperglycemia, and this has given rise to new uh, investigations into the link between melatonin, maybe circadian rhythms, uh, and control of blood glucose levels. But beyond uh, trans the, the, the simple transference from genetic associations, epidemiology, into biology, there are other ways in which this understanding has helped uh, science. Firstly, it's helped in terms of target validation. So in the case of diabetes, we know that there are a, a set of uh, drugs that impact an, on the, uh, the, the GLP-1R receptor. This is a, a therapy for diabetes that also affects obesity and diabetes. But it wasn't known whether it had any long-term complications, particularly on heart disease. And genetic variants in the GLP-1R receptor are associated with lowering of blood glucose levels. And it's also possible to show that they are also associated with lowering of heart disease risk. And this form of use of genetic epidemiology can help the pharmaceutical industry in identifying uh, credible targets for intervention and also can uh, pinpoint likely complications and side effects in the long term. And this is important because uh, the, the cost of developing a drug and then finding out late that it's associated with side effects is, is very large. The second uh, area where genetics may help is in unraveling causal inference. In epidemiology, many factors are associated with outcomes, but it's impossible to tell whether they're causal or whether they're associated with the outcome via a different pathway, which we call confounding. This is a problem that's inherent to the, to the study of, of human populations, uh, and it is impossible to get around by any form of analysis. However, genetic variants uh, can be used in, to mimic a randomized controlled trial in a, an approach called Mendelian randomization. So if you can find uh, a genetic variant that's associated with an intermediate trait, it's unlikely to be uh, confounded because that genetic variant has been present since birth and it reflects a lifetime's exposure uh, to, the, to the intermediate biomarker in question. And it's possible then to use genetics to try and unravel causal pathways to diabetes. Now this may sound very technical, but it's extremely important because it could help us focus our attention on pathways to diabetes that are most likely to be causal and, and could uh, help us avoid wasting time developing interventions for non-causal pathways. The final question that arises is, is whether any of this understanding about common genetics can help in terms of personalizing prevention and personalizing treatment. I spoke at the beginning about how monogenic forms of diabetes and obesity have led to personalized treatment. Currently, there's really no evidence 
that understanding of common genetic variants will lead to any improved therapy or, as we know at the minute, will lead to uh, stratification or any personalized prevention. Now that isn't to say that that won't be possible in the future, it's just at the minute the level of understanding that we have uh, does not suggest that we should be targeting prevention on particular subgroups who are characterized by certain genes for obesity and diabetes. The current weight of evidence suggests that actually everybody should be engaged in efforts to lose weight, be physically active and eat well. And it's not uh, a preventive message that res is restricted to a particular genetic subgroup. I mean, the scale of the studies that have been necessary to identify common genetic bases of obesity and diabetes are truly huge. One of the first papers we wrote on this topic in around 2003 had uh, a case control study of 100 and, uh, 500 people with diabetes and 500 people without, and involved the study of 73 single nucleotide polymorphisms. The studies we're doing now involve hundreds of thousands of people and rather than studying 70 or 80 single nucleotide polymorphisms, we're directly measuring about half a million and then imputing 10 million. And that's over the course of the last uh, 10, 15 years. So the scale of the endeavor, the size of the study being undertaken and the depth of the genetic information has really uh, increased exponentially. So type two diabetes varies markedly around the world in its prevalence. So one of the key questions is whether our understanding about genetic variation is at all uh, explaining the global variation in the prevalence of the condition. And the short answer to that is no. And that's probably because common variants, which are the ones that we're studying most commonly when we use genome-wide association studies, are common to all populations. And they tend to be uh, to be tradition old genes that probably predated the, the mass human exodus from Africa. What is true is that, that more of the between population difference in, in genetics and probably in diabetes risk is explained by more recent genetic variation. And that tends to be rarer and tends to be uh, particular to particular populations. And that's a very difficult challenge. Now there's been some progress. Uh, certain groups studying particular population isolates have been able to identify rare genetic variants that cause disease in that population. For example, in a Greenland population, there is a gene that particularly affects the two-hour glucose uh, and not the fasting glucose. But that gene variant is almost entirely only found in, in that Greenland population. So it has big insights into uh, biology, but in terms of explaining variation in disease between populations, uh, we're really only at the beginning of our understanding.